everyone. Today I'm joined by archaeologist John Thomas. He's the Deputy Director of the University of Leicester Archaeological Services. Welcome, John. Hi there, how are you? I'm good, thanks. And um, how are you? Very good, thank you. What we're going to talk about today is something really, really exciting. You may have heard about it in the news very recently. An amazing Roman mosaic that was discovered in the county of Rutland um, in England. It is absolutely amazing. John um, has been heading up that excavation and very fortunately we are joined by him today to get all the details and all the nitty gritty mm -hmm. on this mosaic. So John, how exciting is this? Incredibly exciting, absolutely brilliant. This is um, a one of a kind mosaic that's been found in the UK. It's the only one of its type that we've found uh, in the last hundred years. It's probably the best Roman mosaic that's ever been found really. So, and um, to, to add to that, we've also got a fantastic picture of the villa complex that surrounds it. So really fantastic new information that we have for the Roman period in our part of the world. This is amazing stuff. So Rutland, that's that's quite a, a small county, isn't it? It's right in the centre of Britain. It's the smallest county in England and they're very proud of it <laughs> and quite rightly so. Um, yeah, it's, it's very centrally placed in England. Yeah. And um, actually, there's been a few time team excavations in Rutland as well. We did one a few years ago, Oakham Castle. Um, that's right. Mm. And um, I believe that you've done a few excavations, time team excavations in that area as well. So I've done a few in Leicestershire. I didn't unfortunately work on the uh, the Oakham one, but we've I've worked on um, uh, the one at Grooby Castle mm -hmm. uh, in Leicestershire, uh, one at Staunton Wyville, and one at East Langton. So quite a few really. I've had some great experiences on time team. Actually, um, the Staunton Wyville one, we did um, an interview back in the summer with Peter Liddell. Actually, oh yeah, of course, yeah. Um, where we actually talk about that excavation there. Actually, yeah, that was that a great was one, brilliant mm. one. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so we've got Leicestershire next to Rutland, hence Leicestershire University's involvement in this. Um, so let's just talk about this mosaic. So it's an amazing mosaic, isn't it? It's really well preserved. Yeah. Um, but obviously it's part of a Roman villa. So we've got we've got the mosaic, but obviously it sits within a wider context, doesn't it? But let's just concentrate on the mosaic for a minute. Why is it so unique? It's unique because of the subject matter. So it's the first time in, in Britain and one of only a handful of cases from across the whole of the Roman Empire that illustrate scenes from the Trojan War as narrated by Homer in the Iliad. And um, so this scene in the Trojan War, so when we're talking about the Iliad, this is an epic poem that goes way, way, way back to ancient Greece, doesn't it? Um, yeah. Probably first written down in about 700-ish. Um, and it's part of an oral tradition that, um, so poetry is passed down. You have a bard who might be sat in a hall, everyone's gathered round and uh, having a nice sip of wine or whatever. And these stories are told. And part of this story is about the Trojan War, isn't it? So yeah, really added yeah. about um, the last month or so of the Trojan War. Yes, it's towards the end, isn't it? So, but as you say, it goes all the way back to what we call the Bronze Age, doesn't it? So way, way earlier than Roman times. Yes, absolutely. So uh, there were there were bits within the poem where, um, for instance, when they're describing swords and things that really sound like um, some of the swords, some of the objects that were discovered in Bronze Age Greece, like at the site at Mycenae, for instance. Um, and so what I love about this um, oral poem, this epic poem, is that there are elements that stretch right back to Bronze Age Greece there um, that have been passed down through the oral tradition, through this story, um, mm. all the way, well, up to today, really. Yeah. The really exciting thing is that it's ended up on a mosaic in Britain, fourth century AD, um, which is, you're looking at a good thousand years or so before, um, when it was written down in about 700 BC, all the way through to the fourth century AD. And it's yeah. travelled all that time. That story has ended up sort of in a field in Rutland. I love it. <laughs> it's incredible to think about, isn't it? You know, how much time and space that uh, story has travelled and, and how much it's changed since it was originally told. Yes. And, uh, and that's the interesting thing about what we're seeing on the mosaic itself. Because yeah. um, as you say, the, the story that's being told is at the very end of the Trojan War. 
it's uh, depicting a, a, a sort of battle between the Greek hero Achilles and the Trojan prince Hector. Now, the lead up to this is that Hector has um, killed in battle Achilles' best friend, Patroclus, and he is um, absolutely enraged by this and, and wants to take out his revenge. Mm. He challenges Hector to a duel. In the mosaic, they're um, shown fighting on, ch on chariots. Uh, eventually, Achilles is victorious, but even then, he's not satisfied with his revenge. He needs more. So he drags Hector around the, um, the tomb of Patroclus from the back of his chariot. And uh, that's what's shown in the second scene. While, um, so while the father of, um, of Hector is, is pleading for the return of the body, and then eventually in the final scene, we see um, Hector's body being actually returned to, to King Priam. He's, he's come down and, um, and sort of, um, he's had to come all the way down to Achilles' camp. And Achilles is shown with um, two attendants and he's, he's offering back the body, but only uh, in exchange for his weight in gold. And so you can see this fantastic figure in the middle of that scene holding up a gigantic pair of um, weighing scales with poor Hector's body on one side and, and Priam loading up gold vessels on the other. So it's, it's quite evocative, really. Mm. But, but it's interesting because these scenes are different to what is narrated by Homer. Yeah. Um, so it, as we've said, the, the, the story has traveled a long way in space and time. It's clearly got a little bit changed along the way. So, I mean, there's lots of um, interesting disjunctures between what we see on the mosaic and the, and the story told in the Iliad. Mm. So in the Iliad, the duel was on foot, uh, but in this version, they're on chariots. Uh, in the second, part of the, the panel, the, um, the body being dragged around, you can see there's actually blood pouring from wounds. But in um, Homer's version, the gods actually protect um, Hector's right. body. Yeah. Mm. So they, they stop it being um, pulverized by, you know, in, in the way that Achilles wanted to do. Um, but, but, but finally, the, um, in, in the Iliad, there is an exchange of, of, of goods for Hector's body, but there's no uh, account of, of him being weighed. That's like a, a throwaway comment by Achilles in that, you know, I'm not even going to give him back, even if he's given, if I'm given his weight in gold. It's a bit of a, um, an insult, really, to, um, to Hector's family. Yeah. Um, so in this scene is a dramatic kind of move away from the original. Um, where, we, where we have seen um, that kind of treatment of the story, um, my colleague at the University, Jane Maseglia, who studied these um, um, texts in quite a lot of detail, has recognised that there's a, um, there was a, a later playwright called Aeschylus, who's a few hundred years later, and he produced a version of the, the, the story to, for the stage. Mm -hmm. And he introduced this weighing scene for dramatic effect. So presumably that's where this scene has come from. Yeah. But we're not quite, because the, um, the fragments of his text are very uh, disjointed. There's not a lot survive. We don't know whether the other scenes kind of reflect the play or not, but potentially there is a, quite a, um, a mishmash of, of different um, versions of that story that perhaps is the way that the owner had it set in mm -hmm. their mind and, and, and portrayed it on the ground in, in the way they did. I love that because, um, you know, we're talking about um, the, the Iliad, the story of the Trojan War, really is, it was passed down um, in poetry. There were bards that yeah. would tell these, tell the stories um, in verse form and they have all these particular epithets and whatnot, don't they, or recognition. Yeah. So it might be Athena of the flashing eyes or whatever. Um, and you get these things passed down, but obviously stories change over time or, or, yeah. or a different person might do a different version um, or chuck some yeah. you know, special bit in. And that's what we're seeing happening here, isn't it? It's a yeah. bit like doing like, I don't know, a cover song or something. And you go, well, this is my version. <laughs> Yeah, and different people may put different emphasis on certain characters. Yeah. Uh, in this one, in you know, um, in the Rutland mosaic, Achilles is clearly prominent. He's yeah. much bigger. He's displayed in a much bigger way. I mean, that may be because he's um, heroic 
uh, and he's and he's featured uh, in all of the panels. He's not wearing any clothes, so he's heroically heroically naked. Yeah, but he's always so much bigger, statue. more generally than um, than Hector is portrayed, and and the, and the other characters. Yeah. Um, we know that uh, in the in, towards the end of the Roman period, Achilles becomes a quite an important figure in um, in in Roman on Roman mosaics. Mm. But he is he is depicted in in other British mosaics, different aspects of his life. Um, but but not these scenes before. But but generally speaking, he does become quite a prominent um, figure. And it may be that there's a conscious effort to sort of engage with that those earlier traditions of um, oral storytelling and the yeah. and the sort of um, classical nature of those. You know that the people in this country are trying to engage with that more mm. fully for whatever reason. And I think the the um, idea of um... Achilles being quite central to this mosaic is absolutely central in the Iliad as well. The opening lines are sing muse of the wrath of Achilles. And it's because Achilles is so fed up, so frustrated, so angry that his lover, I mean, you called him his friend, but it's actually his lover, Patroclus, yeah, yeah. actually goes out dressed in battle as Achilles because Achilles is sulking in his tent and he won't go out to battle. <laughs> <laughs> um, so Patroclus says, right, OK, come on, I'll go out, but I'll go out in your armour so everyone will think, oh, Achilles is back. And Patroclus is killed. Um, obviously, Achilles is absolutely devastated by this, realises that, you know, he shouldn't have been sulking in his tent um, and then goes out to, in, in his wrath, seek revenge. And that's <clears> when <throat> he goes for Hector, poor Hector, who is son of King Priam of Troy. Um, and there's um, some amazing bits in the Iliad, really, um, that you can, Hector's so human, isn't he? Um, yeah. Whereas Achilles is kind of half God. He, Achilles yeah. is the hero. Like a demigod, Hector's isn't it? kind of, mm. you know, um, and it's just amazing that, you know, this is the really key point in the Iliad. Everything in the Iliad, in the story, kind of builds up to this point where Achilles and Hector meet. Um, and then what happens after that? Yeah. And so it's such a poignant um, thing to portray on a mosaic. Ah, I love it. I love it. Yeah. But there's a, there's a brilliant link actually to um, that um, transfer of the armor um, because we, uh, we 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 were puzzling over this because in the um, early scene in the first scene you can clearly see there's a difference between the shields that both yes. of the main characters are holding, and then when you get to the second scene. Unfortunately, the damage um, means that you can't see the faces properly. But, but the you know your your gut instinct is this is what the, 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 this is who these people are, and looking at the uh, the, the the way everything's laid out. But um, the shield that Achilles is is holding in the second scene is is the one that Hector is holding in the first scene. Ah. So mm -hmm. by then he's he's taken his armor back, right. uh, or at least his shield. And uh, and that's what's going on there. His retrieval was rightfully his. Mm. So really nice little details like that that are in the mosaic that really kind of make yeah. you think this person was very aware of of the whole story, you know. So talking about details there in the mosaic, is there anything potentially archaeological that this mosaic can tell us? Can it tell us anything about Roman or British life? Yeah, I think it really can, actually. There's an awful lot of detail <clears throat> in the mosaic. And one thing that has been noticed is that the, um, the clothing on the uh, characters, particularly the, uh, the man at the top who's holding the scales, mm -hmm. is, is very reminiscent of late Roman clothing. So it may be that there's another bit of detail being added into the mix there, that you are seeing this story being, being told as, it, as the owner understood it but also a little bit of a spin on um, contemporary clothing that's been, mm -hmm. being portrayed. The other interesting thing about the mosaic, um, potentially archaeologically, is that the sort of dynamism of, of the scenes and the colour palette that is used is quite unusual. And it has been suggested that the Im influence of, of, of the, uh, the mosaic came from a, an illuminated manuscript, Ooh. which may have been in the possession of the owner. Oh, I love that idea. Oh, so so tell us more about this idea. Where's that come from then? Well, this has come from David Neal, who's oh, um, yeah. who mm -hmm. helped us on on the project, and he's one of the country's foremost mosaic experts. 
Uh, I don't think there's a mosaic in the country he hasn't seen or, or indeed painted and because <laughs> um, he's such a fantastic artist um, and he'll be producing one for us eventually. Um, but um, no, it's, it's something he, he noted when, when he was looking at the scenes. There are certain aspects of the um, imagery. So you'll see that uh, some of the sort of elbows and, and parts of the characters are kind of transcending the borders. So they're not completely hemmed in. Um, and the, 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 you know, the full range of characters and just a general dynamism of the scenes that are going on. I particularly love the, the way that the, the horses are shown to be moving um, with um, pulling the chariots. There's a real kind of flow about them, you know, with the, the kind of legs moving and the manes flowing behind them. It's fantastic, really. And to be able to kind of execute that in little bits of stone and tile, it's pretty skillful, isn't it? It is, really is, isn't it? Yeah. Um, so that's the mosaic, um, mm -hmm. and I'm sure there's going to be much, much more information forthcoming on that in the future as we get people like, I'm, I'm guessing, you know, other archaeologists, art historians, um, classicists, all um, sort of looking at it and examining it further. Um, but let's just try it from an archaeological perspective, talk about it in its wider context now. So can you tell us a little bit more about what you think um, is happening in the area surrounding it? Um, when the find was first discovered, we could see that there was a um, crop mark mm -hmm. of um, the building in which the villa, in which the mosaic sat. Um, you could see from satellite imagery. And that showed as a, a rectangular building on one side of the site. So we knew that was there. Um, but um, we subsequently engaged with the geophysical company well, actually, it was uh, John Gator's company, <laughs> who also is, has a time team connection, um, Sumo <laughs> Survey. Yep. So they did a combination of magnetometry and ground penetrating radar across the, the very large field in which this mosaic was found. And the, both the um, techniques worked to treat together. Um, so the magnetometry showed that um, the complex was surrounded by a whole suite of angular ditches. So there's, the whole thing lies within a, a huge um, sort of trapezoidal um, multi-ditched enclosure. And the, the icing on the cake really was the, the results from the radar survey, which really showed the range of buildings. So the radar survey picks up the, the solid archeology span under the ground and so it, we've got fantastic results from that, which really give in very high detail, um, show us the range of buildings. So not only do we have this very complicated, what we take to be the main villa building in which the mosaic sits at the Northern end. Um, we have a range of aisle barns, wow. big circular structures, um, little buildings, which may be um, sort of on their own bath suites, that kind of thing, but spread oh. over a very wide area. And so this is probably one of the fullest and most um, complex Roman villas that we found in our area. Wow, that's amazing. I mean, obviously we were excavating, I don't know if you've heard, um, in, uh, back in September um, at Broughton, um, we were um, excavating a, a, a villa site there, which was really interesting. And right, uh, yeah. again, we had obviously um, John doing the geophysics, looking at the wider area and whatnot. Yeah. yeah. Um, and it is it is really exciting <coughs> when you find things like that, isn't it? And you start to see them appear, as it were, from the geophysics. Yeah, it's wow. amazing. It's the it's the best GPR um, results that I've ever seen, actually. <clears throat> and I think that um, the SUMO team were equally impressed as well. Yeah, it's yeah. incredible. It must be a particular sort of combination of the uh, the, the, the effects of the, the survey and the and the geology mm -hmm. uh, and the very good survival of the archaeology. We found that the walls are actually incredibly well survived, even though it's been ploughed um, for, for quite a while. It's uh, uh, fortunately, I don't think it's there's no evidence for medieval ploughing, which probably would have been a bit more destructive. Yeah. And that, that may have helped survive, things survive. But we found where the buildings are because of the way they've collapsed or, or been demolished. They're actually sort of very hard, solid islands of rubble. Mm. And so the, the modern ploughing hasn't eaten into them. Oh, wow. That's one of so those it's almost like amazing a perfect flukes, storm of, um, of um, you know, sort of fortunate events that have helped this site to survive, really. We're talking of fortunate events, actually. Let's talk about how it was actually discovered. So 
So this is one of those classic uh, sort of archaeological stories, really. <laughs> it the is, the farmer it? Jim, or the farmer's son, I should say, Jim Irvine, was out walking last year during lockdown, trying to get a bit of exercise on, on his land with his family. And he noticed uh, something he hadn't quite seen before when he'd been on, on, on the site. He'd been working on the land for since he was young, I think, um, helping his dad and his family. Um, but he started, him and his um, daughter started picking up some um, bits of pot and tile. And there was quite a bit, quite a few of them. And he, he didn't really know what they were, but he knew there must be something. So he went back and did a bit of research. Um, part of that research was to, to look at satellite imagery for his field. And this is when he, he noticed a crop mark. Um, he actually then went out and did, he worked, he's, he's quite canny. He's, he sort of worked out where, um, where this crop mark was by looking at the, um, the tram lines in, in the field, because he knew that they were cons consistent every year. Ah. And so he could see where they were. And he actually went out with the intention of um, digging down to see if he could find a wall. Um, what, what he actually did was miss the wall and just land inside it. And that's when the mo part of the mosaic was revealed. Um, <laughs> and subsequently, a little bit further work, he realized that this was something quite special. And um, this, this was when, thankfully for everybody concerned, he did the right thing and, and got in touch with the um, planning archeologist at Leicester County Council, who then got in touch with us. Could we come out and help? Uh, and everything spiraled from there, really. Wow. And this is, it's, it's an amazing story, isn't it? That, um, you know, and thankfully, um, Jim, the landowner's son, actually recognized what the, the value and the archeological value how yeah. important this was and um, you know yeah. spoke to the county archaeologist got people involved yeah. and and i believe it's now been protected is that correct it is it's now a scheduled monument so as part of the work we did last year was a lot of evidence gath gathering mm -hmm. to present to historic england and so now the site is protected by law as a scheduled monument so no it's quite unusual actually um for things to become to be ske scheduled monuments isn't it they have mm. to be it has to be something amazing something really rare and um, something yeah. really well worth preserving um i think it, it's important to point out um you know because sometimes there is that bit of worry between landowners farmers versus archaeologists that mm. if an archaeologist comes on your land or whatever before you know it it's going to be scheduled <laughs> and that's not quite the case is it it has to be no. something absolutely amazing it, it's very rare that anything like that becomes scheduled so in my career this is only the second um site that i've known that's been discovered in this way that has become scheduled and that's 30 years worth of working yeah <laughs> yeah exactly but it's amazing that it has been scheduled and, that, you know, obviously we can clearly see why it has. Been. Absolutely. And um, sort of looking at the criteria that Historic England use for, for, for making that decision, um, it ticks quite a lot of the boxes. Yeah. All of them, probably. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> We've kept uh, Jim and his family involved all the way. Jim helped with, with the excavation. Um, he's got um, uh, a little mini digger, so he helped with the um, exposing of the trenches in the very beginning. But after that, we couldn't keep him away and he was involved <laughs> with the excavations as well. Thoroughly loved it um, and was a great asset to the to the team. I think um, if he ever wanted to change career, we'd certainly take him on. But um, <laughs> um, the main reason why we were able to come back in September was that um, it coincided very well with the need for a new training school for our students at the university. Last year, they couldn't do anything yeah. um, because of COVID. So there was a bit of a backlog. So we've, um, we took 20 odd second year students with us for the training excavation of a lifetime, I think. Yeah, wow. Uh, yeah. What a and, first uh, thing to excavate. Yeah, amazing. <laughs> yeah. They're probably quite well, spoiled now. I know. Yeah. <laughs> They'll be expecting that every time. <laughs> It's, absolutely um, i thought if only it were like that every day <laughs> i know it's, re it's really great to, to to provide that opportunity for the students and not only um give them that wonderful opportunity to work on something like that but you know see the benefits of of um engaging with the community and uh, and all the other aspects of a project which doesn't always happen um on, on a training excavation so this one was particularly special for that 
Well, I'd love to keep in touch with you and the rest of the team. It'd be great maybe to speak to Jim at some point, actually. Yeah, That'd be fantastic. Yeah. Um, yeah, if you'd be happy to kind of keep in touch with us and let us know of future developments, that'd be fantastic. Certainly will do. Brilliant. Thank you. Thank you so much for joining us today. Really enjoyed that chat. Really, really, absolutely amazing discovery. So uh, congratulations. <laughs> Thank you. To ensure you catch all the latest updates, please do subscribe to this channel, follow us on social media, sign up to our newsletter and join us on Patreon.